In the outline of the productive structure we have just looked at, how much did economic agents, as consumers and entrepreneurs, spend on consumer goods? 100 monetary units. Well, let us suppose that suddenly, out of the blue, and to make this illustrative and eye-catching, everyone's time preference decreases. The intensity with which everyone values the present over the future decreases in relative terms. Therefore, people become willing to postpone the attainment of consumer goods, that is, the achievement of their much-desired ends, into a more distant future. Of course, other things being equal, we all invariably value the present over the future. What I am saying is that the intensity with which we value the present more than the future suddenly diminishes. And to make it quite clear, we will suppose that all of a sudden, instead of deciding to spend 100 monetary units on consumption, we decide to spend 75, and we decide to save the rest. We will suppose that economic agents suddenly decide to save 25% of their net income. In our example, we imagine they spent 100 units of their net income on consumer goods. So, now we will imagine they decide to save 25 and spend only 75 on consumer goods. Well, if this happens, three extremely important effects are exerted on the economy. We will consider them one by one. The first effect is that if we suddenly decide to consume less and spend 75 instead of 100, what do you think will happen to the sales of the Corte Inglés? They will go down. And what do you think will happen to the accounting profits of the companies closest to consumption? Will they thrive or will they start to suffer and go into a spin? They will begin to decline. So, because an increase in saving means less consumption, it gives rise to an initial drop in the relative profits of the companies closest to consumption. Meanwhile, the profits of the companies furthest from consumption remain unchanged, since these companies are producing goods that will mature in two, three, four or five years' time. Do you see? So there is a disparity in profits. Do you remember that in the chart of the productive structure we have just studied, the rate of profit or interest rate though this is a rough, imperfect way of speaking, was the same over all the stages, 11%. That is a result of entrepreneurs' desire for profit. If they see that in one stage there is a lot of profit, and in another stage there are losses, what do they do? They abandon the less profitable stages and move to the more profitable ones. And what effect does that have? Well, when more is sold in the stages with large profits, prices fall and profits decline. And when entrepreneurs abandon the stages with small profits, less is sold, and profits tend to rise. In other words, the very force of entrepreneurship, which fuels the search for profit, puts into operation a process of speculation and arbitrage, which tends to equalize profits over the different stages. If suddenly, out of the blue, people save more, this process begins to operate the profits of consumer products companies fall, and the profits of the companies further from consumption rise in relative terms. Thus, the first effect reflects the essential role profits play in a market economy by guiding entrepreneurs in their actions. And what profits are saying to entrepreneurs is, ladies and gentlemen, you need to divert your efforts from immediate consumption, sales of consumer goods, the corte inglés, etc., to an area where more relative profits are being made, mining, blast furnaces, etc. In immediate consumption, profits have fallen because people have decided to consume less. This is the first effect, a disparity in profits, which is an essential sign to entrepreneurs and directs them in their actions. The message is, hey, what happened? People are deciding to postpone their consumption into a more distant future. You should devote your efforts to activities that will mature in a more distant future, because activities which mature today, in immediate consumption, are generating very little profit. This is what chart V2 describes. The final stage, at period T plus 1, is when consumption drops to 75 units. Note the profits at the right, and that profits in the stages far from consumption are much larger than those in the stages close to consumption. 
Remember that consumption and the companies devoted to the final stage of consumption represent only a small fraction, one third or so, of all productive effort. These companies now slip into a decline because they are bringing in lower profits. And if the Corte Inglés is bringing in lower profits and selling less, do you think the company will hire more workers? Do you think it will lease or build more facilities, etc.? No, quite the opposite. The owners of companies close to consumption will have to tighten their belts. And to keep their companies profitable, they will have to free up labor, stop hiring or lay off workers. Because they have fewer sales, they must draw back, contract, and they free up productive factors, workers and labor. Where do these workers and that labor go? They are demanded and placed precisely in the stages furthest from consumption, the stages with the highest relative profits, where entrepreneurs redirect their investment efforts. In fact, if something characterizes the whole process of economic development, it is that a lower and lower percentage of workers are devoted to consumption, and a higher and higher percentage are devoted to the stages furthest from consumption. In India, where capital equipment is lacking, and people harvest by hand or use a Roman plough, everyone is very close to consumption and very poor. In the United States, in Switzerland and in Spain, a much higher percentage of people are devoted to the stages furthest from consumption. Incidentally, if I am an entrepreneur and I decide to disinvest in consumption and the corte inglés and to invest in computers or blast furnaces or telecommunications, then, when I invest in computers, blast furnaces and telecommunications, those companies distant from consumption demand labor. If, as an entrepreneur, I redirect my investment efforts to the stages furthest from consumption, telecommunications, computers, blast furnaces, those companies are going to demand more labor and productive factors to expand their facilities. The goods they are producing are not for immediate use today when consumption has dropped. They are producing goods for consumption in three, four, five years, or however many. Do you see? My question is, will those companies be obliged to pay higher wages and higher rents to attract factors of production? This is important. The answer is no, because even if they demand more, and that is a force to push wages up, it is no less true that the companies close to consumption free productive factors so the supply of them increases. Therefore, there is a gradual restructuring. It takes place little by little, and is subtle but firm and sustainable. Consumption becomes less and less substantial in relative terms, and more and more of us, in relative terms, work in the stages far from consumption. And that is the firm, sustainable process of healthier economic development, which characterizes economic growth in any growing economy.